Welcome to the latest episode of British History, Royals, Rebels, and Romantics, the podcast for people who understand that history shows us what's possible for us in our lives today. I'm Carol Ann Lloyd, your host and tour guide as we travel back in time. We're shaking up history to look at the stories that don't always make the history books, to consider famous and infamous characters in new and interesting ways, and to look for all the things that we share even when we're living in different times and places. I hope you enjoy this journey through the royals, rebels, and romantics of Britain. Now, let's explore history together. I remember my beloved Aunt Jackie telling me years ago, Carol Ann, your hair is the accessory you take with you everywhere. I think she was helping me decide on a fun new haircut from a more expensive than usual salon. Of course, she was right. Throughout history, the story of changes in fashion and sometimes politics can be told through wardrobes and accessories, and that includes hair. So let's take a look at some of the greatest, most absurd, most controversial, and most lasting hairstyles of history. Medieval hairstyles. Life in medieval England was heavily influenced by the Catholic Church. This extended to hairstyles. Around the 10th century, the Church began issuing statements about the appropriate length of men's hair and the need for women to cover their heads in hair. In 1073, Pope Gregory VII banned beards and mustaches among the clergy. Some clergymen instructed the population to follow their clean-shaven example to dedicate the dedication to the church. King Henry I cut his hair and shaved his beard in 1130 to please the church. This style, with men's hair length about to the shoulder and clean shaven, lasted through the next hundred years. Women traditionally had long hair that they braided or dressed in chignons. At this time, it became fashionable for women to reveal their foreheads. No one would think of wearing bangs. Single women sometimes secured their hair with silk threads or fine netting and ornaments. Hair was considered part of a woman's sexuality. In fact, a married woman's hair was considered her husband's property. Married women were required to cover their hair with a veil when they attended church gatherings or went to public places. Renaissance hairstyles. As the Reformation progressed, the strict rules of the Catholic Church began to disappear in some places. In England, this was reflected in hairstyles. Even before the break with Rome, Henry VIII and other modern, early modern monarchs tried wearing beards. Henry VIII and Francis I famously promised each other they wouldn't shave until they met at the Field of Cloth of Gold in 1520. Henry spoiled the game by shaving early, and it was left to Thomas Boleyn to explain to Francis and the French contingency that the king had bowed to the request of Catherine of Aragon, who preferred her husband clean-shaven. Pretty ironic it was Thomas Boleyn taking that job, huh? Many men of the 16th century wore a short beard, closely cropped, and dressed frequently to maintain the style and shape. Coloring hair became popular during this time as well. In fact, the famous astrologer and reputed seer Nostradamus published some recipes for elixirs to turn hair blonde. Other colors became more popular as the century progressed. When Elizabeth I was on the throne, some women tried to dye their hair red to match that of the queen. Elizabeth's reign in particular saw women abandon the notion of covering their hair with a hood and veil. Hair was visible in Elizabethan England, decorated with jewels and ornaments. The focus on the forehead became even more pronounced, as women sometimes plucked out their hair to take the hairline back and reveal even more forehead. There's a great example of this in the marvelous BBC production of Elizabeth R., starring the brilliant Glenda Jackson. If you have not seen this, do yourself a favor and watch it as soon as possible. I've read that Glenda Jackson was so dedicated to the part that she plucked and shaved and did whatever it took to get her hairline back to represent that of Queen Elizabeth's. 
So sometimes when I look in the mirror and see my own hairline retreating, I can remind myself that I'm just leaning into my Tudor obsession. In other words, I don't just wear my love of the Tudors on my sleeve, I wear it in my hair, the accessory that I take with me everywhere. Thank you, Jackie. Of course, if hair is exposed for the world to see, what happens when it turns gray or begins to thin? You'll notice from portraits of Queen Elizabeth I and Mary Queen of Scots, that doesn't seem to happen to royals. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. Wigs. Even though St. Bernard de Clairvaux said in the 12th century that women who wore wigs were committing a mortal sin, this condemnation had been swept away. Queen Elizabeth I had several wigs. Some people think as many as 80. The wigs covered the reality of aging, something that had become a political stand as Elizabeth refused to marry and produce an heir. Mary, Queen of Scots, a redhead like Queen Elizabeth, also wore a wig. As the years went by, she crafted an image of a beautiful royal martyr. Portraits of her show her in modest widow's wear, dark clothing, and understated hairdressing. As a strong Catholic, she covers most of her hair, but clearly visible around her face is the lovely red hair of her youth, or so people thought. At her execution, when the executioner held up her head, he was left holding only the red wig as her head, with its cropped gray hair, fell to the ground. Bit of a morbid way to find out she was wearing a wig, right? Revolutionary hair! As we leave the Tudors and move on to the Stuart reign, it's the men whose hair takes center stage. Starting with Charles I, the Stuart kings of England wore big wigs. That's where we get the phrase big wig to mean someone of wealth and power. The notion of a big wig sometimes meant someone whose wealth and power put them out of touch with the real world. That's what happened with Charles I and his long, abundant curls. In fact, the abundance of that curly hair gave the king and the royalists their nickname during the English Civil War, the Cavalier. It's associated with the French word chevalier, meaning horse. Think a horse's mane, abundant hair, dressed and styled for royal processions. The parliamentarians, on the other hand, were known as the roundheads because they couldn't afford the huge wigs, and their closely cropped hair showed the round shape of their head. In portraits of the Civil War, the roundheads are shown wearing helmets, which are also round, and the cavaliers are shown wearing fancy hats with feathers. Ah, which do you think would be better for fighting a war? Whatever they actually wore during battle, the parliamentary forces prevailed, and Charles I lost his head and his curly wig on January 30th, 1649. It was a stunning execution that changed the monarchy and the country forever. Oliver Cromwell established a republic known as the Commonwealth of England. After his death, his son Richard took over, but without a power base in Parliament or the army, he was forced to resign. Parliament made adjustments to the role of king and invited Charles II, son of the beheaded king, to return from France and take the throne. You might think after a civil war and execution, Charles II would try to appear a little less remote and removed from the common people. Not so. His wigs were bigger and grander than his father's. And when he died without an heir, his brother James took over. Another big wig. In fact, James pushed Parliament too far when he married a Catholic after his first wife died and managed to have a son, introducing the possibility of a Catholic heir to the throne. Parliament invited William and Mary to take the throne, and James II, with his big wig, were forced out in 1869. Victorian style. As the more bewigged Stuarts and Hanoverians left, hairstyles changed when Victoria came to the throne in 1837. A young, unmarried woman, Victoria wore her hair down for her coronation as queen. Victoria wore her hair with a simple wreath of orange blossoms for her wedding. In portraits and photographs from her wedding and beyond, Victoria's simple hairstyle is evident. She adopted a style in line with the time, with her hair dressed up and a long loop over her ears, or pulled back completely. After Prince Albert died in 1861, Queen Victoria went into deep mourning, which was reflected in the way she dressed and styled her hair. She dressed in black for the rest of her life. Her hair was pulled back more severely, tucked under her widow's veil. 
Only after years of pleading from Parliament ministers did she agree to wear a small crown and more elaborate veil over her hair. The Brothers and Their Wives The 20th century saw royal women again setting the pace for hairstyles that made a mark. An interesting comparison is that between Wallace Simpson and Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, the women who married royal brothers, both of whom became king. When the future Edward VIII was Prince of Wales, he was the fashion focus of the royal family. He popularized what is now known as the Prince of Wales collar. He wore his ties in particularly tied knots, wore checked suits, and embraced a broad color palette. It's no surprise he would attract a woman also known for her high fashion. Wallace Simpson loved fashion and influenced fashion choices around the world. Her clothes sparked controversy. She once collaborated with Salvador Dali, who designed a lobster print for a gown she wore in 1937. Her style became even more sophisticated, the more famous and controversial she became. Her hair reflected her interest in the latest fashion. Understated and elegant, she always looked as if she had just stepped out of the salon. And in essence, she did. She called on her hair hairdresser, Alexandre de Paris, to dress her hair every day. Royal photographer Cecil Beaton described her hair as so smooth and glossy that a fly would slip off it. Compared to this polished, bright, and brittle elegance is the more down-to-earth style of the Prince of Wales' brother. Before he became George the Sixth, the man known as Bertie was happy to live quietly out of the spotlight. When his brother abdicated and he unexpectedly became king, he knew he and his wife would need to look the part. In comparison to the sharp angles of Wallace Simpson, the new Queen Elizabeth can best be described as soft in style. Her hairstyles as a young woman were flowing curls. When she became Duchess of York after her marriage, her hair was dressed more formally, but still very soft around the edges. For her wedding, she chose a medieval-inspired dress and always preferred fluid shapes and drapes that were more flattering to her figure. Her designer came up with an uncluttered look, a matching outfit, hat, gloves, bag, and shoes. Her hair became part of this, with hats designed to show her face to the crowd and her hair tucked neatly and securely away. After the shock of an abdication, the new king and queen deliberately cultivated a family-based and family family friendly image. They wished to reassure the public that they were exactly the right family to represent Britain as the war loomed. During World War II, when Queen Elizabeth visited the bombed out areas of London, her look again was cluttered and soft with fabrics that fell in flattering ways and her hair tucked away under her hat. The current queen and her family. The tucked away ha hairstyle seems to have been adopted by the elder daughter of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, our current queen. Her hairstyle has remained largely the same throughout her reign, serving primarily as a place to display the elegant crowns and tiaras at evening events and spectacular hats during the day. The queen has been known to let her hair down, so to speak, in casual events, wearing a scarf over her hair while riding or attending races or family events. That's about as far as she goes. But even if her own hair has been perhaps less than remarkable, there have been some spectacular hairstyles during Queen Elizabeth II's reign. Let's look at just a few to finish our discussion. Princess Margaret's curly hair was typically kept fairly short and dressed away from her face in a style that was not much different from her sisters as they were growing up. But later there were a few times that Margaret really let her hair down. During the 1960s, Margaret grew out her hair and wore it long, stepping away from the like Elizabeth look of earlier years. The longer hair allowed for a big poof, which is a key component of one of the most iconic photographs Princess Margaret ever taken, wearing the Pulitmore tiara in the bathtub. The photo was taken by Antony Lord Snowden, Lord Snowden, who didn't release it publicly until four years after the princess's death. His family has now withdrawn it from public view, but it can't be erased from memory. All she's wearing is that tiara and her gorgeous hair. And of course, on the heels of Princess Margaret is the woman who rocked the royals to the core and changed the image of the monarchy forever, Diana, Princess of Wales. Her hairstyle seems to echo her 
overall change in fashion. The early images of the blunt bob with long bangs she could almost hide behind matched the ruffles and bows of her early outfits. Her cut remained similar in her early marriage, although she added highlights to brighten it up a bit. She was growing out her hair a little bit, which captured a fantastic photograph of her on a tour of Australia and New Zealand. Her hair sparkles, the Spencer Tiara sparkles, and her smile is dazzling. In the 1980s, Diana tried her hair shoulder length for a while. Then she added bangs and volume in her hair and her shoulders throughout the end of the decade. Toward the very end of the 80s, her hair was choppier and shorter and her bangs styled off her face. In the 90s, the princess opted for shorter bangs and bright curls shortly before her separation from Prince Charles. In 1995, Diana wore a daring slicked back style for the Fashion Designer Awards in New York. That new look generated lots of positive press. For the final years of her life, Diana's hair was short and chic and elegant. She looked professional, confident, and ready for anything. The tragic death of Princess Diana in 1997 left a void in the world, and especially in the lives of her two sons. Both boys have grown up and gotten married, and their wives now offer the hairstyles of the future. With bouncy curls, sleek ponytails, chic updos, and messy buns, the Duchess of Cambridge and the Duchess of Sussex are making royal style their own. So, what do you think the royal hairstyle will be in the next 20 years? Thank you for joining me for this look at the history of the accessory we all carry with us every day, our hair. Join me next time as we continue looking behind the scenes and into the closets of the Royals. Till then. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share with a friend. Do send any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you where we should explore next. And please subscribe and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. I'm so glad we could explore history together. Till next time. Thank you.